Okay, fourth graders, we are back for the chapter called Seven O'Clock. We are on page 27. Arthur helped me do dishes and fold diapers that night. He didn't seem to mind. In fact, once he caught on to Mom's quick flip system, his diaper pile grew faster than mine. Mostly, we didn't talk while we worked. I think Arthur knew I was feeling bad. I couldn't forget what Dad had said, no matter how hard I tried to turn my mind to Stacy or something pleasant. I kept hearing him say, the sun doesn't rise and set on you, accent the you. The truth is, I'd never once thought the sun rose and set on me, so why would he say that? I shook my head and carried the folded diapers down the hall to Ryan's room. Mom was rocking him to sleep, but she smiled at me and winked, as if she knew how bad I felt. A little later, while Arthur and I were trying to decide if we wanted to ride bikes or hang around waiting for happy days on TV, Aunt Goldie popped in at the kitchen door. She was wearing pink shorts and a frilly blouse, carrying a coffee can full of strawberries. Hi guys, she greeted us. She held up the can before setting it in the sink. From Mrs. Smiley's garden, she explained. Where's your mom, DJ? That's short for Daniel John. She's getting Ryan to sleep. He's been a terror all day. Oh no, she said, making a face. Then she bent down and hugged me. It's not always easy having a baby in the house, is it? I was glad somebody understood. She peeked down the hall but came right back, her finger to her lips. I'd better not disturb them. Linda would kill me. Now, I love my aunt and all that, but I didn't want to get stuck having to sit there and talk to her while Mom was busy with Ryan. I made a quick decision and got to my feet. Arthur and I were just about, were just leaving to ride bikes. Hey, wait, tell you what. I just stopped by to borrow Linda's bowling ball. Riverside's league starts tonight, and in case I can make myself go, she rolled her eyes. You know where she keeps it? You go into West Side Lanes or Meaves? Arthur asked my aunt. I headed for the hall closet. Meaves, she said, but only if I can't get out of it. I mean, I'm a dancer, you know. It's not just my thing. I'd almost rather stay home and straighten my hair. It was a family joke. Blonde, curly top Goldie staying home to straighten her hair. She was always getting suckered in on something she didn't want to do. Aunt Goldie thanked me for the bowling ball and left the house when we did, but not before kissing me on top of the head. Be careful or the wind will blow you over, she warned as she got in her car and backed out. I could see what she meant once we hit the street. Even riding my slick new Voyager, head down and first gear, it was tough going. Arthur, on his dented up, rusted out, untuned BMX, was practically standing still. Let's go over to your house, I shouted, thinking of Stacy. Why? I don't know. I sped up so I could test my brakes. Arthur popped a wheelie, then squeaked to a halt alongside me. He tried spitting into the wind, but it splattered over the curb two yards behind us. Some breeze. Bet I could stay all night with you, he said in the sly way he has of inviting himself. Well, why don't you then? Mom says I shouldn't be the one to bring it up. Okay, so I'll bring it up. Would you sleep over, please? Arthur's face brightened. I guess mine did, too, because we took off pumping hard and laughing for no reason at all. On wheels again, I was definitely feeling better. We nearly covered the three blocks between my house and his when the street lights came on. With the sky all black and snarly with thunder, the way it was, lights were popping on inside houses, too. Made them look like friendly little way stations in the dusk. I swung around at the corner of Fonda Way and waited for Arthur, who was still grunting and puffing half a block away. I'll always be glad I took time to notice how beautiful Sand Crane Drive looked in that weird half-light. Up and down the streets, trees swayed in unison like dancers in a chorus line. Overhead, clouds boiled so low you could almost jump up and grab them. It was unreal, all the creaking and moaning going on. Arthur went on past me, peeling left on Fonda Way, when he should have peeled right to go to his house. Where are you going? I yelled. Come on, I want to show you something. I followed him past Aunt Goldie's, past Mrs. Stevens, and the McWhirters. Across the street, Allison, Haddad, and her mom waved at us as they carried groceries in from the car. Big storm coming, Mrs. Haddad called out. Better get home. Allison looked away embarrassed. What are we stopping here for? I asked when Arthur bar braked at Mrs. Smiley's. Come on, you gotta see something. We went up the sidewalk and stepped quietly onto the broad front porch of Belle Smiley's old house. Hers was the sort of place that, on Halloween, you halfway didn't want to trick or treat. 
It always looked so spooky under those giant cottonwood trees. Arthur, you nuts or something, I said in a hoarse voice. You're not going to ask her for cookies. We'd done it once or twice in our lives. Didn't you notice anything different? Arthur asked, standing there with a dumb smile on his face. I looked around, but I couldn't see much. It was dark as a skunk's insides on that porch. Then Arthur was pushing the doorbell. I'll let Mrs. Smiley tell you, he said, and he pushed the bell a second time. There's a light on. Looks like she's back in the kitchen. I'll bet she turned off her hearing aid. Let's get out of here. Then Arthur pointed to the new aluminum storm door with a screen on the top half. You've got to be more observant, Dan. What is this? I croaked. An IQ test? Yeah, and you just flunked. I could sense Arthur's disappointment in me, so I stood there observing Mrs. Smiley's door the way he wanted me to. What am I doing here? I kept thinking. All I'd wanted was to see Stacy Darlington in her natural habitat. Mrs. Smiley must have heard us all right because another light went on inside. We could see her crossing the living room, sort of swaying from side to side the way she does. She's just a little bitty thing, but with legs like parentheses, she walks funny. Who is it? She called as she came along. Arthur answered, It's me, Mrs. Smiley. Me and Dan. Oh, my, she opened the door. Isn't this nice? Won't you come in? We're on our way to my house, but Dan wanted to see your new door. I did. Mrs. Smiley flicked on the porch light so I could see. Isn't it a beauty, she asked. Then she demonstrated the lock and explained how her new door didn't squeak, didn't slam, didn't swell up and get stuck in the kind of drippy, drizzly weather we'd been having. Wow, I exclaimed, starting to be impressed. I pictured Mrs. Smiley's original door. Inside a green wooden frame was this screen with 14 patches on it by actual count, one of them dating back as far as World War II. She had sewed her patches on with different colors of yarn, which she had said attracted the butterflies. I sure hated to part with my old door, she sighed, after the years of service it gave me, but when my son came visiting from Ohio, he insisted. She shook her head sadly. Why don't you get rid of that old eyesore, is the way he put it. Finally, there wasn't anything else to talk about, and the wind was threatening to blow her over. She made us promise to tell our mothers hello. I was supposed to remind mine that Mrs. Smiley would need her hair set Friday morning because of our Presbyterian Church Bazaar. I only have two days to finish my needlepoint cushion, she told us, but it'll bring a fancy prize when it's done. We started edging off the porch. Come see me again, she said, and we told her we would. Know what she did with her old screen door? Arthur asked as we got back on our bikes. What? She gave it to me. She did? That old thing? What for? It's a work of art, man. I ought to worry about him, I remember thinking. At the darling thing? At the Darlingtons, everything was as usual, chaotic. They weren't exactly the Brady Bunch, but they sure could have used a good maid like Alice. We stepped over Gwen and Theo, who had paper dolls spread all over the living room. Don't walk on Pr Prince Ragnor, Gwen squealed, covering the royal wardrobe with her fat little body. Tabby was practicing the piano, her fingers flying up and down the keyboard doing scales. Ronnie Bay was folded up in a big chair in the corner, having a giggly phone conversation with some other ten-year-old. I looked around for Stacy, trying not to be obvious about it, but she was nowhere in sight. She pretty much lived with her friend Evelyn, the way Arthur lived with me. And Mr. Darlington was only home on Sundays, so I didn't bother looking for him. He grows plants at the Lewis Greenscape during the day and is maintenance foreman at the National Guard Armory at night. It takes a lot of money, Arthur always says, to keep food on our table. And that's where we found Arthur's mother. At the kitchen table, pushing Angelique back and forth in the stroller, reading a book and eating potato salad at the same time. I really like Mrs. Darlington. She's one of those soft, cushiony types with a round face and pink cheeks, who's as nice to her kids as friends as she is to her kids. Arthur headed for the fridge, so I sat down on a stool nearby. Is that a new book, Mrs. Darlington? I asked politely. She always liked to tell me about her books. Romances she bought ten at a time with her groceries. Oh, yes, Danny, she said, shaking her head, and I'm so disgusted with it. How come? I read to page 114 and still nothing's happened. I mean, you know, by page 114 something ought to be happening. She took another forkful of salad. Old Shirley Mulhallow really let me down this time. 
Can I sleep over at Dan's tonight? Arthur asked as he handed me a slice of bologna wrapped around a pickle. Only if you're invited, she answered. Then she was off again, flipping to page 115, looking for something to happen. And that's the way it was last summer, the 3rd of June. Without knowing it, we were all waiting for something to happen. I guess that's life, huh? The whole world is waiting around to see what will happen next. But even Shirley Mulhallow, who had sold 250,000 copies of Love's Searing Flames, according to the book cover, couldn't have imagined what was about to take place in Grand Island, Nebraska. Before Arthur and I got back to my house, televisions up and down the street were announcing tornado sightings in the vicinity, but some of us didn't hear that first weather report. Mom was busy sewing. Karen Darlington was glued to her paperback. Mrs. Smiley was no doubt hunkered over her needlepoint. My grandparents, we later learned, were both, in, were both out in the shed watching Dad work on the tractor. Grandma was delivering a pot of coffee to them about that time. Nobody knew for sure where Aunt Goldie was that night. Or the next. Or the next. And that's the end of that chapter. Next time we'll be ready for chapter 8 o'clock. Stay tuned.